Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And I'm Tom Scholey. Going to dive into an overview of Wally Wood, the great late Wally Wood from the Woodwork Exhibition Catalog. But before we open this thing up, what's new, Ed? Red Room, issue three, is going to be on the stands at the end of uh, July 2021. Two issues are out as we speak. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in the Red Room universe. And these comics are coming out monthly. Got to thank everybody for supporting the project uh, right now. Uh, we got our numbers in for issue three, and they're still strong as hell, so I have to thank the Kayfabe uh, community. If you want to order, pre-order those comics, go to your local comic shop, put in your reservation, or go to the Fantagraphics website in my link tree in the description below this video, or uh, hit up my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. You could read about five issues of Red Room as we speak, and I put new strips up every Tuesday. Three bucks get you the archive of, for all of it. All the links in my link tree. Uh, you can check out my graphic novel, Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics, uh, Fantastic Four Grand Design. Check out my uh, YouTube channel, Total Recall Show, and my Patreon. Go to patreon.com, search Tom Scholey. You can join me on patreon.com slash Jim Rugg, where you can find out-of-print zines and mini-comics that you can download, lots of original art. And uh, I am promoting Super Mag here from Ad House Books because they keep selling out of all of my books. And I think this is the last uh, of their publications of mine that is still available in print. You can find that at the Ad House website. This is a one-man anthology uh, inspired by books like 8-Ball, where I am just doing a variety of strip styles, uh, artwork, all the things that I do. This is probably the best sample of, of what I do, how I make comics, and all of that good stuff. And you can follow me and join me on Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. But we're here today to talk about Wally Wood. Uh, this is one of, I think, several volumes that this company has put together in conjunction with art shows. We looked at Ditko Unleashed as another volume. I just think the reproduction is amazing. These books are beautiful. And for these artists that have decades of work, um, finding a, a resource that really covers their, their life and their career, I love that as an overview. I think we'll dive into more Wally Wood as, the, uh, as, as time goes by, but this will be a chance to kind of give an overview of Wood's career and life and work, and, uh, and we'll proceed from there in future episodes. But uh, we'll just go through this and kind of talk about what we know about Wood as we see some of his artwork. That's really cool. That would, that would be cool to have, like, Jack Kirby's dog tags. Sure, man. That's a good art show, man. Have the dog tags of all the, the uh, Golden Age cartoonists that did some, did some dirt. Yeah, Wood serving both in the Army and then also doing a lot of work that was published by the Army in some of their, uh, some of their publications for soldiers. See, that's super cool because like I, like I don't know that, right? And a project like this can provide those kinds of contexts and stuff. I always feel like Wood looks sad in photos. You know, there's I, I such a mythology <laughs> around him. And it, it, it makes me so, uh, so bummed because it's the first thing I always think about. And I, this book does a good job of not dwelling on his, uh, his fate. Doesn't that say something uh, interesting? I can't see it from the distance, but I, I remember seeing, like... Well, I know he has, know, like, an enemies list that's posted there, too. Well, there's one that's, like, hi hi puffing himself up, like, you're, you're Wally Wood, or, like, some, something <laughs> now, like I, that. I think we've talked about this photo and, like, how, like, we imagine that as, like, maybe, like, a possible, like, end game <laughs> for, like, you know, the, a cartoonist life, but... I, I heard recently it's, like, not as bleak as it looks. Like, we thought, like, oh, this is where Wally Wood lives. But what I heard recently was that, you know, he, he just got married and his wife was, like, kind of, like, remodeling the house, doing up the house. So this was just where he set up shop. It's like a little, you know, pool house or whatever that he set up shop in while she was, like, fixing up the main. Well, well, so that's it, a much well, better uh, version than, than, than the picture yeah. itself. <laughs> than the Dan Klaus context that he provided <laughs> because he called that a piss bucket. A piss bucket, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you start looking at this photo closely and seeing like weapons mounted on the wall, nunchucks and knives. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a bizarre one. And, like com compare this to to like the um, uh, uh, Tezuka, you know, like that that Tezuka video in that know? studio. Yeah, yeah, in his little studio. Yeah, very different. But one of the points that they make is, you know, early in his life, he decides he wants to draw comic books. Not comic strips, you know, yeah. not just art, but comic books. And I think that's kind of cool, you know, like he's probably one of the early, early uh, guys that really went comic books, you mm -hmm. know, at a time when people would lie about their occupations, people that were making comic books. Wood seems like that's the goal. That's the dream. And uh, certainly this book will show how, how successful he was in that regard. Yeah, he wasn't afraid to hide his name, like his signature. Like he's one of the first kind of comic book artists I was kind of aware of. And I think it was just that like awesome signature that he has. So they give some biographical information. 
uh, you know, just growing up, guy who likes to draw, and you get to see, you know, very cool to see examples of those mm -hmm. childhood drawings. I always love seeing that kind of stuff. Not not dated. They just have circa 40, so can't tell exactly how old he is, but obviously, you know, like teenager, mm -hmm. young, young artist, young budding art, artist, long before he's in uh, professional, uh, you know, up to the profession, but like, a, you know, six armed character with his head cut off, stabbing, <laughs> stabbing him. Like he, these are all self inflicted wounds. Yeah, pretty bizarre. I don't know what that, what kind of childhood that's coming yeah, out of. Show that to to his uh, therapist. But man, good, pretty much from the get go. You know, if you assume okay. these are teenage drawings, like pretty impressive. You you usually find that to be the case when there's like somebody who has kind of a virtuoso level of talent, like that that. That's, that's not that craft stuff that you could just learn over time. Like, there's some inherent energy there. And, and these projects are are worth it for this super early material, man. Like, stuff that's prohibitively expensive, stuff that uh, isn't reprinted. These are examples from the late 40s, so entering, you know, entering the profession. Uh, I don't know how old he, maybe late teenagers, whenever he starts actually doing this stuff, but, you know, you can see sort of typical Golden Age comics, a variety of genres that he's working in. And again, looks good from the beginning as far as I can tell. Yeah. Yeah, I wish I could uh, draw as well as Wally Wood day one, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they just taught people differently back then, man. Like, those, those old masters, those classically trained figure drawers and stuff, they would force your ass to learn that proportion stuff with the pencil at, at the life drawing classes and stuff. And, you know, if you can make that work, like it just, the, the, the sort of illustration world is your oyster. I don't know what the division of labor is on some of these. They call out some of the lettering, which is, you know, this is sort of your Will Eisner uh, serif lettering yeah. that uh, a lot of cartoonists have a version of that. And I, I guess it traces back to Eisner, at least he popularized it. So I assume this is Wood's lettering, but not sure about that. Uh -huh. Don't know how they know that at I this point. I guess he, he was doing... Uh, Porn comics from the beginning. <laughs> I love these two color. Mm -hmm. I don't know who's publishing those at the time, but man, that's so cool looking with the two colors. Yeah, that's something that's kind of escaped history in a way. Like, uh, you, you know, it was always four color. You know, stuff that would be like this would be the like Bazooka Joe type small things, not, you know, regular publication. You're like British reprints. Right, yeah. And doing that, like, book like perspective for a cover design we've pointed at kirby doing that with stuntman i always like that that kind of motif so kind of an interesting that's a beautiful cover with jekyll and hyde's giant face in the background all grotesque looking super strong for 1950 you know like for early work of his like that's that's noteworthy starting to become himself like that that left eye that's a wallywood eye a lot of eyeballs throughout this. A lot of close-ups of eyes as you get into some of these pages. That's interesting, Ed, the thing you brought out about, like, inherent talent. Because that's something, like, whenever people, like, ask me about, like, you know, like, aspiring cartoonists and stuff. Like, I'm always, like, you know, there's no such thing as inherent. Like, you just got to work at it. You got to work at it. But, no, there are, you know, they're, they're not common. But there are those occasional, you know, people who just come out swinging. Yeah. A Alex Ross comes to mind when you see his mm -hmm. childhood stuff. It yeah, I, the thing I always say with that is, like, you won't find any examples of a successful person who's just the talent. Like, right. they'll also have that, that work will be folded in, the work ethic part. Even if they did start out better than the rest of us, yeah. you still sort of have to put in the hard work part. Especially for comics, there's just no shortcut for it. Yep. Love this, like, seeing sketches, you know, putting together as roughs. It's amazing to see that. And uh, interesting because, like, one, he, he would work this way. Like, I guess it would have been relatively common that these sketches were part of both commercial art and comics, you know, thinking of, like, teaming up with Kurtzman and working from layouts. But also, as we get going, you'll see, like, Wood was known for having studio and having lots of assistance and a lot of famous artists that come through that studio system. So he's sort of managing this kind of stuff, too, as he progresses through his career. We're starting to see the Wally Wood kind of title lettering. You know, he would do a lot of the sound effects on his pages, and it would be this very kind of thick line with just these very simple bubble letters. Some some of my favorite kind of uh, yeah. sound effects and stuff, man. So noteworthy here that we got to this point. Um, you know, it's the My World yes, uh, totally. font. Master of Methods and Materials as well. You know, he really shines. If you get those Russ Cochran 
uh, EC reprints, you really get to see him at work with that stuff. And this is a Duotone application. Very often he would use Zipatone, Duotone, every now and then a little bit of like coquille board with, with like a grease pencil and stuff. Just uh, doing a lot of, a lot of, a lot of fuss, man, to get some gray on the page. Yeah, and we'll see some really good things. More of these, I actually flagged one later in the book that's duo, duotone uh, examples, but a lot of those screen stuff as we get into some of the originals that are available for this book, you will see all of those materials applied. And it's worth noting, like, um, you know, inside front cover with Joe Orlando, a lot of the credits are with somebody. And as the text explains in greater detail, sometimes it's really hard to know exactly who is doing what. Uh, but all of those assistants, at least the ones that I read the interviews from in this, and there are a lot of excerpts and interviews from different people that worked with him as well as from Wood, but they all give the credit, like clearly this is a Wood. Wood is driving this engine, even if he, if other people's hands are on the page, Wood is sort of like the, the, the maestro conducting it all. I'm a, I'm a devotee of the, you know, the EC body of work. And uh, that's sort of a revelation to me that that Orlando w worked as assistant or whatever to Wood, but you know it shouldn't be because he he's always looked like Wood or yeah. whatever. But I thought that it was just kind of like the Kirby thing, you know, just a, just another guy gets a job and tries to you know, stack up to the rest of the the crew. But I guess it makes sense that he would have worked with the guy. And it's possible it's not. I don't know that Orlando's exactly an assistant. Like, I don't know how that breaks down in terms of the collaboration and who's getting what credit. But at some point, Orlando's an editor, I think, at DC, and then he's bringing Wood into work. Um, you know, so I think it's just a lot of passing pages back and forth, especially in these early days. Like, we're still in 1951, you know, and I think that it was a lot of guys sharing studios, and it's like, deadline tomorrow, can you can you uh, lend me some time with your brush? <laughs> Joe Orlando was on Daredevil before Wally Wood, too, I think, man, so... That's that's a, another cool connection. I love these old titles, man. Like these are comics you just never hear of. I, I like the the format that we've seen on the last couple pages, where like the inside front cover is this like beautiful black and white page of comics. Like that that's something to rip off. Yeah, for sure. Uh, these are Avon publications too. So back in Golden Age, pre you know 1954 Senate hearings, like you see all these publication or publishers that don't survive that uh, implosion of the 50s. So definitely a different landscape for these, you know, pre mid fifties. Wouldn't it be amazing if if Avon was the same Avon as like those old ladies <laughs> that come to your mom's house? They started out selling those products in comic books and just went full on products. <laughs> There's one of your inside covers, Tom, mm -hmm. and it is beautiful. Different lettering styles. I feel like you would see screen tone and duo shade on the same page, like beautiful. I feel like you would see like Rick Veach do this kind of thing uh, on the inside of his covers and stuff. There's quite a few of those reproduced, mm -hmm. and they all look, look yeah, terrific. Yeah, super sharp. And it looks like it's done, like, originally for it. It's not, like, sometimes you'll see that yeah. in, like, a Marvel thing where they'll just grab a couple random panels and smack no, it in there. No, it's like, This is, like, specific. Yeah, it's very, like, well-composed and yeah. stuff. And just, like, looking at these, you know, work begets work, and we're seeing him get stronger and stronger, and these are amazing portfolio pieces to go show Bill Gaines or Will Eisner, I guess, is going to be coming up uh, before before EC. They're also, uh, they remind me a lot of illustration, which we're going to yeah. see him do things, you know, Alka-Seltzer ads and stuff mm -hmm. like that was a, a thing that he dabbled in, but didn't apparently like enough to, to pursue, but was certainly talented enough to do it and conscious of it. I, I see like magazine illustration in the way some of these things are laid out, uh, which would have been a huge field at that time as well. Yeah, these inside covers are killer. Mm -hmm. Definitely maybe a high point from this uh, early first couple of years in the business. Yeah, probably put all his energy there that is like prime we talk about prime real estate in a magazine that inside front cover ed you're so right about all these covers it would almost be like if you were making a mockumentary comics history where you're just making stuff up you have paratroops especially, prison break especially this yes. man like you know prison ladies with cleavage out and stuff yeah that's the other uh trope right with that with wally wood is just how well he draws beautiful women a lot of these covers and, and splash pages are showing that off Interesting to see the employment of like Leroy lettering on a lot of that those old comics even pre pre E C. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great I, I love that time period where it just feels like the rules the, things aren't standardized. You know, you'll see different approaches to lettering from like that mechanical style on. Although here we are at Tales from the Crypt, so getting into the E C era and look at that young wall yeah. wood. Full of life. Still sad. <laughs> still, yeah, I was gonna say still not smiling. Yeah. <laughs> A little bit of hooch right next, man. <laughs> that was standard operating procedure back then. 
I'm always blown away when you see the original art of any of those EC books. Yeah, yeah. Well, we still have volume two uh, in the in the other room that we're gonna have to look at uh, for for a Sunday video, man. For sure. Complete master race where you see all the cut ups. Also, like this is a great spread to show the difference between these printed pieces, what they look like after they go through the printing press with color versus the sharpness of the original black and white art. And I mean, they, they almost look like different art. And yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I realize these are different pages, but same concept, you yeah. know. And it's weird that this is what it looks like once you buy it off the stand. Yeah, the co the color steps don't help, uh, you know, with those dots that are set far apart. Uh, it gets much more smeary. Like, that Leroy lettering could be downright illegible uh, if there's, you know, enough ink on on the on the page and your your traditional wally wood title lettering ed you you pointed out earlier you see it again here very common throughout his ec stories and of course known for science science fiction probably one of his uh stronger genres mm -hmm. coming out of ec yeah he you know i guess being being in the military i don't know like what was he army dude navy i think he was in the army so like a lot of the interior structures of his spaceships are just like submarines. Two Fisted Tales now starting to starting his collaborations with Harvey Kurtzman. One of the things that I always say about Wally Wood is that he's <laughs> by the way, Wally against Harvey as they view it. <laughs> he's you know, he's a heck of a drawer. We've 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 seen that, man. Yeah. But as a cartoonist, he excelled when he was reined in by Harvey Kurtzman's rigid layouts and his kind of dictatorial editorial approach with his cartoonists. And all those guys were served well. Will Elder, yeah. Jack, Jack Davis, they consummate, they were consummate illustrators, man, but Kurtzman made them incredible cartoonists. This is incredible. The, the power of this kind of story and the graphics that are involved, like showing the stark black mm -hmm. and white you know, is for uh, the explosion moment, the white heat. That's really a great graphic effect. Yeah. That's Sin City. I think all those guys were big Hal Foster fans. Oh, of course, too. yeah. He was in the running to take take over the strip. Like, he, he submitted some stuff. It was, you know... There's at least John... one, one page of that submission in here. Great. Yeah, I think he only may, might have done one... Um, and of course, it went to John Cullen Murphy. But when you see this, there's a clear Foster mm -hmm. uh, love and approach. Yeah, you'll see it in several of his projects throughout the decades following this, of like the knights, that medieval time period. Yeah. The, the armor is one of those textures that I always think of uh, with that time period. It does a lot of stories that are set in that sword and sorcery kind of realm. He's, he's the guy that has that maxim of like, you know... Uh, don't you know copy how's it go like don't draw what you could copy don't copy what you could trace and don't, don't trace, trace what you can cut out and paste down. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like when you see like the, the one sort of homework of that sort of ideology with his characters is that he doesn't abide by and you see it a lot in the superhero comics uh there's no 10 heads tall guys man because he's tracing you know muscle man magazines or whatever and if you do that you realize that even a strong guy's sh shoulders aren't that far away from, you know, the centerpiece of the head. And uh, his so his characters all have this kind of squat approach because that's the proportions of a normal man. But when you uh, filter it through comics, that looks slight. Right. And, Ed, you mentioned the, uh, the Eisner spirit collaboration, Spirit in Space. Uh, here we are, Summer 52, and that's what we're starting to see here, the spirit in outer space. So I feel like this stuff is pretty was a little bit out of order. Because, it is a little bit because that he sees slightly later. But. Yeah, and he overlapped. I don't know where this comes up, but it's mentioned in this book, and it's probably somewhere in the beginning, the origins. But he never wanted to work for just one publisher at a time. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if he had been burnt by you know if he had put too much stock. Maybe it was post DC that he came out of there with that idea. Mm -hmm. But throughout this book, you'll see him like I think of it as hustling. Yeah, yeah he's that everywhere. freelance hustler. Yeah. But man, he's always working with several publishers at once, it seems like. And, you know, 52, there's some overlap there between the EC work and the and, and then, you know, working with Eisner to, in to, his spare time. <laughs> to, to some extent, uh, that's that's gaming the system for yourself. It, that's taking advantage of the fact that you're not an employee of these companies. Mm -hmm. uh, so during this time, and I guess even now, uh, in, in a way, like, you, if, if you are working for a Marvel or DC... There is opportunity, and there is there are things to take advantage of there, 
since you're not an employee. If something isn't going right, you could just fucking quit that day and you're not on the hook for anything. It's kind of beautiful, actually. Speaking of beautiful, what a sci-fi yeah, panel that. that is. Yeah, man. Even with her breaking the panel border, yeah, it's just it, a hell of a panel. The rendering it, on that moon and the shadow. It's really sweet because you get a little Eisner and a mm -hmm. little Wood on the page, man. Yeah, the, the Harvey Kurtzman stuff and then the Will Eisner stuff is a really good argument for collaboration. Yeah. Yeah, and it's also, uh, talk about grad school for a cartoonist. Like yeah, early in your career, best, you spend yeah. a couple of years with, with those guys around you. Yeah, you're going to come out of there with some strong ideas on how to make comics. Back and to the EC era. So, you know, those that early EC might have been uh, like the earlier, a couple years earlier, you know, because here we are in 1953. I love this story, man. Like how he's like he's sort of giving up his name. And as he commits suicide, he's knocking all the light bulbs out. <laughs> that don't, you know, spell his name. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a strip with Frank Frazetta. I was going to say, for, uh, the, the right here, collaboration. The, yeah, I was going to say right there, it looks like a, there's Frazetta in that. That's another thing that's kind of interesting, how, how those guys would overlap. Like Al Williamson is somebody that'll sort of yeah. pop in and out of Wally Wood's life, uh, whether it's helping on deadlines or collaborating or publishing him in Wits End, stuff like that. But I see, like, you know, you see stylistically those things overlapping. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, is this is that a Frazetta hair? Is that wood? You know, I think they were all... Who could you be better influenced by? You know what I mean? Like, look to your left and see Frazetta. Of course there's stuff that you can uh, fold into your own work. Very famously, there, there were the, what they call the Flegel Gang. Wally Wood isn't exactly associated with them, but it's, you know, Williamson, Frazetta, Roy Crankle, Angelo Torres couple other guys but it would make sense like why, why wouldn't wood pop through and you might not know it in like 1953 but you think of like wood's career and what we know about him now looking back where it's like oh yeah i can do disney style flawlessly yeah. i right. can do whatever uh -huh. kurtzman wants me to do in mad magazine yeah. you know this variety of, of uh copying newspaper yeah. cartoonist styles like of course if you're brushing up against the frazetta and you see something you like if you're wally wood it folds right in how about those for silhouettes? Yeah, inverted silhouettes. Like that's something that I don't often associate with his his box of tricks. Man, that architecture is so cool. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that this week reading some different comics, and uh, and we'll get into those in other videos. But seeing this kind of approach where it's like that could be such a generic piece of architecture. Yeah. But if you're doing a sci-fi story, like go for it. You think Mark Schultz saw this stuff and it's just like. <laughs> <laughs> The, the like Wally Wood um, artist edition really blew me away because there'd be like panels where there's like a painting hanging on the wall in the background and that is like a fully drawn composition in itself. Beautiful arrangement of black, white, and gray. Yeah, the he's using are strong. He's using uh, Zipatone to to amazing effect. Interesting textures, yeah. white zips to communicate that water. He's he's employing every kind of illustrative trick to get these black and white. 2D images to really sell. Oh, well, Burns in in that Burns might have picked a little something up, man. I always like this idea of like the inverted line, like in shadow. You know, you get to yes. a certain stage where you learn to draw perspective and other things, but now you gotta gussy it up and, and make it make it have some life to it. And this is like one one way to to do so. And that's two pages. You know, this this whole story. No human figures in sight. So to be able to go through all those pictures and know what you're looking at and feel where you are without like a human being is a, is a pretty amazing accomplishment. That's a great point. Yeah, the textures are unreal. These are blinds, and you can see like that's not a screen or a zip where he's drawing in between them. That's incredible. And then those paintings, Tom, you're talking yeah. about paintings standing out. Like we've seen a few examples of that with this interior design where it's like. Not just the spaces, but also what's on the wall, really. Yeah, and he's doing like Picasso-esque compositions in, in that one. More of those kind of squat figures with that, that are just proportioned like actual human beings. And a nice example of original versus your printed colored, uh, mm -hmm. you know, final cover there. Yeah, you know, like the, the 1950s EC comics seem a lot more lurid in color and a lot classier in black and white. <laughs> it's very true. It feels like he takes up his uh, his detail and his his black and white pen work goes up another level when you see the covers. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. It does, except who knows that you have another gear whenever this is what your interiors look like. <laughs> yeah. Now, is this a Joe Orlando 
like is his name mentioned on this thing? Um, no, I guess not. Yeah, I don't see, you know, like here's your, your listing, but I don't see another no. uh, yeah. person listed there. But they do talk about it in the text sometimes. You know, even if they're not credited, some of these pages are done, you know, yeah, in, how these, you in know these studios and things, and, and sometimes it's just not credited. My, my very first... Uh, Great panel borders, too, for working on that EC pre-ruled out kind of sure. page layouts. For sure. My, my very first uh, EC hard, hardcover um, Russ Cochran edition was Incredible Science Fantasy. And uh, I actually think this story was in there, even though it says Weird Science. Uh, it made me, it was probably the only time in my life that I felt nervous about being able to join the profession of cartoonist. Right. And it was because of Wally Wood. I would, uh, I was in the stage of copying, you know, I was 10 years old, 11 years old when I found that thing at the flea market and I was copying the guys I liked. Uh, and I saw this kind of stuff. I love the double lighting on the faces. Mm -hmm. That's something that really st stood out to me, but when I tried to copy this stuff, I was so distorted and so askew and just wrong. And it made me feel hopeless for a moment, you know, still, still kept going, but it did make me like sort of lean on McFarlane and, and life felt <laughs> even further. Yeah. This just feels like you're showing off your figure drawing ability. You know, all these mid range mm -hmm. shots where you get full figures and they all look stunning. You see the 22 panels that always work uh, yeah. uh, in this stuff. You know, this is, uh, this is that one that's like, when when you first see the 22 panels and, and you see an image like that and it says Ben Day and you're like, who's that guy? <laughs> <laughs> He's Gene Day's brother. <laughs> <laughs> but not Dan Day. Another example, man. You got, the, you got the duotone, you got the zips, you know, different kinds of zips with the white dots. And then every now and then, let's just, let's just get hatching in there to give you some of that gray. It's incredible. Even the hatching, this is one kind of hatching here. This yeah. is another one mm -hmm. here if that's that not looks a like, screen. Yeah, that might be a screen. screen. But then there's another hatching, you know, as we, as we spotlight her face and head. You know, just on two pages, there's several of these examples. Almost hatching where it's parallel lines now uh, rather than hatching, but again, creating that gray and creating a gradient from the gray into the white. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's impressive. For a guy known for like speed and just trying to get through this stuff as quick as he can, he sure is putting a lot of variety on the pages. This is something he's sort of known for as well, man. Like where he, and, and you always, when we were kids, there would always be some other kind of like perverted Easter egg in a Disney movie or something like that. And it just seems like the hamstrung artist uh, can't help himself, man. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he did the cover for the cat that uh, Marie Severin inked, and, and I think he did the same thing. Like if you see the original art, he's he there's white out whited out bushes and nipples and shit. Yeah, sticking in uh, practical jokes on pages. Imagine if one of these slipped through the uh, editorial guidelines. There's a gr there's they, and they all did this stuff. There's a Johnny Craig one, a Cry of Suspense stories, and you know it's pussy lips and stuff like <laughs> like they just must do that shit to try to make gains nuts. Great alien. David Icke would be proud. <laughs> the famous classic joint, world, man. Yeah, with the famous lettering style. Just gorgeous. And that's some... I guess that's duo shade over time, you know, that chemical eroding a little bit, but it almost looks like ink wash, some of those it background does. details. Yeah, for sure. And this is, you know, one of the one of the few strips that wasn't written by Feldstein or, mm -hmm. or you know, Johnny Craig. Uh, it might be the only thing that, that Wood wrote himself. And again, the book, look at the good job they do of reprinting Absolutely. the original art of these significant stories. And you could see, like, he's going for it, right? So this is a whole pasted up panel. Like, well, actually, I was going to say maybe it's a correction or something, but you could see he's using the grease pencil. So this is like a different kind of paper so that he could get that texture. Man, if we had access to these guys, the question would be, uh, why duotone for these panels? Why zipotone for this? Why mm -hmm. grease pencil for that? When you see something like that where there's so much on display and there's some cool, cool tech pen hatching, uh, it does seem like it's just like he wants to put a variety down. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no specific rhyme or reason other than just trying to make this shit fun for yourself. Trying to make your page look better than Frank Frazetta's that, whenever wonder, it's coming in. I wonder how much of it is like trying to survive in the industry, just trying to be as competitive as possible. How much it is just entertaining yourself and how much it is just trying to like beat the guy next to you. There was a lot of competition from, from you know, word on the street. You read interviews and stuff when those guys are going, coming in on Friday to turn in their pages at the EC offices going through each other's work. 
look at this little detail. So you have, you know, you get these boards and the lettering's already on there. And now he's like circling these, these drop caps, uh, just to add, I guess, a little bit of flair. I also love like going from this white bright panel to the darkness and how much contrast there is, even the openness of this, this panel compared to the panel next to it. What great contrast. These are hard for me to even process, the amount of detail in these small do, panels. Do you think it's possible to like consistently deliver at this level and not burn out the way he burned, burned himself out? I, I, I do, but I, th I think you have to be rewarded with certain successes and stuff like that, man. Like, I, I think, I think that's a great motivator to kind of keep, keep yourself rocking and stuff. But it, it you, when you see the toil on the page like that, there is a little bit of heartbreak in, in my mind. Cause I just imagine a guy just like, you know, staying up for days and, uh, compromising his health. He's for, like, for the work. he's smiling in this last panel, but he sure doesn't look happy. <laughs> <laughs> his eyebrows, I think it's impossible for him to look happy with the way his eyebrows are like constantly, there's, they're just up, they're upturned <laughs> that like, like that furrow, right? And I think that's default. I don't know that he's actually furrowing his brow. I think it's just the way he looks. When he gets older too, the fat pads on his like eyelids, top and bottom, just gets thicker and thicker. And you do not see a discernible eyeball in that head at all, man. So when it comes to the windows of the soul, you yeah. ain't getting it, man. It's just a little slit. <laughs> yeah. This is a cool image. This is his pencil rough for EC was going to do a 3D issue or book. Yeah. And I think they never actually produced it, but he did like the, the art for this. It's in the artist edition yeah. where it's like each plate is, yeah. is there. And I, I, I scanned them and made it into the oh, 3D image so you could, cool. could see it. But uh, it's great to see the pencils because they're so soft compared to what his inking. It's very different than his inks. This is not like when you look at an early 90s pencil page, like an image guy where all the hatching is spelled out line by line. Like this is much more in line of the inker or when you're drawing an ink, you're going to have to interpret what these shadows, how these shadows work and, and how feathering works. Do you ever see Flesh Gordon? The, uh, <laughs> no. the, the 70s porn? <laughs> Just on the rack yeah. in the VHS <laughs> store. Look at all the marginalia. It's awesome. Yeah, so getting into who knew that this great science fiction illustrator could do comedy? You wonder if Kurtzman was just throwing stuff at the wall to see, like, okay, who can handle this? Who can do a good version of this stuff? The, just that, in order to survive back in those days, man, like, you you had to be adept at everything. Things were coming your way, and uh, it would be dumb to, to pass up an opportunity. So you better have a Bigfoot style. You better have a realistic style. Get a superhero in there one time or two. I flagged, by the way, uh, page rate. There's there's a paragraph in here that goes over page rates and what he was getting at different places at different times. And, uh, and I, I made a note on that page, so we'll see it. But I think that's part of why you get the EC work. Like, those guys did understand, one, it, was, it paid more than the other companies, uh -huh. you know, and I think there is competition, you know. So in terms of burning out, I don't know. Uh -huh. But they did seem to recognize, like, the spot they were in, uh, the opportunity that was there. And you know, I always think with these guys, like here we are years later, they're having big art shows of him decades mm -hmm. after he's passed. They're doing artist editions. I, I, don't, I don't know how that works in terms of the life you're living, but if you take this seriously, in some cases it does pay off. It does continue to be celebrated and recognized. and For your heirs, if you have any. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. But, you know, is, is, is that enough motivation to put that extra effort in? You know, mm -hmm. for some people... If it is, it can pay off in terms of a legacy. Prince Violent might have been what I always kept him from too. getting Prince Valiant. Oh, oh you know, right. They might have been like, yeah, fuck you. We, we have to deal with that horse shit, you know, 30 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> you do wonder, uh, it's hard to imagine some of those guys having a sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, how Foster sees them. Oh, what, what? You know, it, what you, Foster doesn't seem that funny. <laughs> he, I mean, when you see him, he's got like a silk robe when he's like in his studio and stuff and like, and, like a pipe. <laughs> I was going to say a cigarette on like a black stick. Yeah. <laughs> Kurt's been recognizing his brilliant lettering probably to, to at least a partial inspiration for the famous uh -huh. sound effects strip. And oh, then, we're getting into the magazine era. And that's that's where the illustration just fucking skyrockets, man. Yeah, no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> that's ridiculous. <laughs> Imagine if you could have a wood piece put on the wall and this is it. I remember uh, <laughs> Klaus would always talk about whatever, uh, you know, uh, the topic of New Yorker covers would come up and he would just like get so frustrated when, you know, Saul Steinberg or somebody just gets to put snowflakes on a cover or something like that. He's like, I spent a week just coming up with the thumbnail. 
this is going to come up a lot is are these uh the borders the cartoon borders there'll be like a few other pieces as he goes through his career where he he comes back and does more and more of these highly influential highly influential this is the shit ed that intimidates me like i cannot do this kind of work but then you only have to do it once and then if you have a hundred issues you can stick it on all of them well well they never did that yeah and i I don't know if i don't know if those are him like that looks like uh, it it may not that's bill elder okay but but this is him we will see some of these, though. Uh, more examples of that kind of cartoon border stuff. Getting into the uh, the comics code, end of an era kind of stuff, collapse of the comics industry, and now you start to see him doing work outside of comics, spot illustrations, uh, magazine illustrations. The stuff that I think some comic book artists aspired to but never made it, like Wood was totally capable of this. So this speaks to Frazetta, right? Like, mm-hmm. here's here's Conan before Frazetta gets a hold of, of Conan, mm-hmm. man. That's that's very noteworthy. I guess these are still, like, the tail end of Pulps, uh, yeah. sort of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, we never think about, like, the sort of legacy of, of, of the Pulps is, like, you know, lasting that long, but... I think there are still vestiges to this day with um, Argosy and stuff like this. And it's awesome. Any of the stuff that's processed, so you get to see a sketch versus the final piece. And note how much she changes in the, uh, you know, like the yeah, kid's basically the same, language. but she's a whole different drawing. One of the big things, like, I made note of as a kid looking at his stuff was the kind of S-curve of the figure. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when, you're, when you're a boy starting out, you, like, you're just, you're just drawing the figure like straight up and down you know and then when you start to see this and how well how elegant it is you start to reverse engineer it and it's like okay like the chin and the tip of the feet like that's what you need to match up and when you do your little s curve and things like that you start to observe also just finding places to put that movement into the figure you know you're exaggerating Mm -hmm. the way we would exaggerate a superhero figure except it's just to have some life, some yeah. motion in the in the drawing. I love this. I think that's just incredible for an illustration, but uh-huh. seeing like that mid-century modern worked into organic shapes of trees and figures around it. it makes me think of like cool Nexus looking. or something. Yes, yeah, for sure. Unpublished, uh, unpublished rough illustration. I mean, that looks publishable. That that looks like the stuff that uh, Howard Chaikin was, was uh, hipping us to from um, these like, illustrations from Vietnam and Life magazine like they're they're as finished as that but Wally Wood can't stand that see like I you I've come across these cartoonists all my life like when I worked with Jay Lynch it was that way like he would send me these scripts that were completely publishable comics but to him they didn't have enough fuss and noodling and they were unpublishable inking Dan Barry on Flash Gordon for a strip but we're also going to start getting into like his Sky Masters uh, collaborations with Kirby as well. Surf Hunters before Sky Masters. Yeah, yeah, uh, never, never made it. To this the goes back to that, like you know, Wood as a studio and putting his hand in different places. His inking was so distinct. Yeah, like if he was inking it, you recognize some Wally Wood in there. Really cool collaborations with Kirby. We'll yeah. see some with Ditko later on. But these guys that are super stylistic pencilers, and then you get a Wood on top of it. There's some amazing synergy between that stuff. Like, that water, spectacular. It's a common ground of all those EC guys, man. When Al Williamson is busting out the ink, uh, like, you could tell it's it's Williamson. When John Severin inks you, you're going away. Like, it looks like John Severin. Ah, Sky Masters by Wood, Wood, Kirby, and Wood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they that, could have opened up their own legal fi- uh, exactly. firm. <laughs> They're so stunning, though. Like, it's such a great matchup. You have all that power and drama that Kirby brings to it, and then you get all of the uh, the detail work that, that Wood adds on top. And it's double lighting stuff. Gorgeous. Yeah, Kirby, uh, Kirby never looked prettier. Yes. Inking Kirby on Challengers of the Unknown at DC Comics. Pretty fun to see little bits of Kirby coming through, uh-huh. but not that much, you know? Like, that's not much of a Kirby face there. Uh-oh. As as we proceed into decades, man. Yeah. I think the conversation is going to change. We're going to get into some fun stuff, though, as he gets into, like, tops. I can't remember what these were for, but he did a series of these. I think it was a proposal for some magazine 
where it's kind of like newspaper strips, but it, it would have run in a particular format, you know, like a half page kind of thing. And it was these biographies of different people. So the Joan of Arc is the one you're looking at here. Just gorgeous. It is amazing. She's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It looks so good. It made me think, though, like this kind of thing, you see a lot of these images, right? Like all the knights on their horses and stuff. It's such a composed thing. Like, I can't imagine this ever makes sense that they're all lined up together somewhere. <laughs> like, like you, you, you use the C word. And when I look at this, it actually, it looks congested and, and not like well composed as illustrations. And, and that's, that's sort of the thing I mentioned, like when we talk about Kurtzman, because, because Kurtzman would figure some yeah. stuff out. Put like some air in there. And also it's like, this is an important piece. Like there would have been a composition that would make this more kind of front and center, but you see how it just gets lost. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's that forest for the trees thing. You know, he's interested in drawing a lot of cool shit. These are also, I think he did five or six of these as a proposal. I wonder if what you see there is insecurity on the page. Of course, you know, yeah. EC's I, I, gone I, away, the, think, the industry's down. It's like, look, guys, I can do everything. I think that's every page he's ever drawn yeah, maybe. Has, has that. There's another one in this series. And I mean, the drawing does feel like it's a, almost a step up. Like he's... Now this composition is incredible. Is, yeah, these planes are just incredible. Dog fighting. That's a good dog fighting panel. Auditioning for uh, Ben Casey. I'm starting to up. get, uh, starting to move towards tops is what we're working towards. Mm -hmm. And I love these showing off like his great lettering within the compositions. So is that wacky packages? I don't think that's, that's wacky like pre, packages. Yeah, yet. some kind of pre prototype wacky package kind of thing. Got Mars attacks. Yeah, that's sick as hell, man. Like I know he would compose all that stuff. Wood being uh, working his way into a panel. <laughs> <laughs> Middle-aged Wood is kind of kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Madman. Of course, meanwhile he's probably like twenty-seven. Or something. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, forty-three-year-old Wood. Hard living. He does a bunch of albums too that we're gonna see. Uh, they're a variety. Some are music, some are like audio book sort of stuff that are pretty pretty damn awesome, like uh, pulpy classics and stuff. But the albums are really neat. Like I like seeing him play with that square format, and we'll see quite a few of those reproduced throughout here. But that's wild with like cartoon character in the middle of mm -hmm. you know relatively realistic social setting. Yeah, it's like Art Garfunkel and uh, Carnal Knowledge or something, man. St sticks out like a sore thumb. Fireball popped out to me. There'll be a few of these panels where it feels so much like Jamie Hewlett. And then I think of like Jamie Hewlett's Fireball is one of my favorite comics of his. Do you know Fireball? Do you know this? This is like the same uh, people as who made Thunderbirds oh, okay. go. So, so I didn't know it. So that's, those are puppets, you know? Gotcha. Like, it, it's pup worth checking out. Like, yeah. I love this show. <laughs> like, even today. Yeah, yeah I, lo I love Thunderbirds, man. And, and the artist on the British version, so like... So like you have to stack up because this dude Frank Bellamy was was the artist on on Thunderbirds and his shit is unassailable. He was like the Wally Wood of 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 Britain when it comes to that kind of thing, man. So he seems like a competitive spirit. Mad Magazine stuff. I recently my uh, my barber gets Mad Magazine. You know, sitting around like you can read it while you're waiting for your haircut, and uh, there was like. I forget what it was, but it was almost all Wally Wood, a recent issue. You know, they do their mm -hmm. reprints and stuff. And it's like, it's still, you know, again, it just perseveres. Like 50 years later, it's like, that's the stuff that's still being reprinted and, and it still holds up. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh -oh. Here we go. Little little stint at the uh, Marvel offices. And this is where you see the, the proportions where he, where he keeps them, you know, st like standard. And how it... it you don't see superheroes that really look like this. Certainly in the post Kirby Silver Age Marvel, you know he. If you're not Wally Wood, you don't get to make comics that look like this for from Marvel. It's a great fit for uh, Daredevil for a, a character that's like that street level character. It's a really good fit for him. There's like a weird like I think because like you know almost the full figure is always shown or something. Mm -hmm. It really feels like color forms or <laughs> stickers or something like that. You never see the character like obscured with something cutting through him or something it's they get just into it uh you know like it's also a much more simple style than yeah. some yeah. of the stuff we've been departure. looking at and they get into that as being like a stylistic choice because it's like one it less pays pay. way less yeah and then two it's a monthly schedule so 
you know, it's, it seems like it was a conscious decision to go that direction. As a kid, it was a disappointment because there was an Overstreet book that had uh, like an encyclopedia, like a bibliography of like maybe 25 different cartoonists or something. And, and, and uh, you know, he, he was one of those people. And the revelation was that he even did any Marvel work mm -hmm. or superhero work in general. And then knowing the EC, weird science, all that stuff, I could not wait to see what a Marvel comic looked like in that style. Yeah, while he was Galactus. Or yeah, something. yeah. And and when I when I saw it, it it was a disappointment to yeah, like yeah. a little kid who is into superficial polish. Inking Kirby on covers and some interiors. Fantastic Four issue or Journey into Mystery. I, wait. Yeah, we got yeah. Thor. Fantastic Four thirty nine. Uh, oh, interiors. I'm gonna have to dig that out. I didn't know he. Uh, yeah, it's kind of cool. That. And uh, starting to get into, you know, it, publishers, I guess, exploiting his ability to draw beautiful women. So starting to see him going down that direction in uh, in one of the avenues of the work that, that he's making. That Fantastic Four one. I don't think he inked the whole issue. I think okay. he just inked Daredevil. He would like oh. redraw and ink dare, uh, all the Daredevils. It was you know some choice. I think of this stands. is just stunning and gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Lettering and every like every part of that, I'm I'm in love with. Yeah, things that you actually would never see at this time, and like the stark, complete yeah. black, you know, black hands with no no kind of modeling. This is an excellent composition, and I hope we get a spl the splash page where Stanley is cutting promos on <laughs> because he's going to leave high and dry, and Stanley's going to say something passive aggressive like, oh, "I'm going to try to make this work, true believers," but Hollywood Wallace didn't give me much to work with. <laughs> there it is, the introduction, boy. Of that, uh, of that red costume. There's a character sheet in that Marvel Abrams book with the turnaround man that yes, Wally I've seen Wood that. Yeah. submitted to uh, get that get that approved. Look at how sweet this stuff is. Here's a quote from Wood in regards to like Kirby and Stan Lee, and extremely critical of the Stan Lee kind of influence, putting his name above everyone else's that kind of thing. He thought it was a good innovation to let the artist write these stories essentially yeah. but then of course stanley puts his name right on the yeah. top of the credits box and, and you gotta pay the artist for the story too yeah he, he ends with all poor old jack gets is a sore arsehole <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean wood was kind of like the first guy to kind of tell tales out of school and like let us in on this you know what was going on there's a documentary uh, i didn't watch it all i was kind of because it was it was uh, most in french a lot of it in search of mobius and they they talk uh, about um, like like Mobius is talking about how he liked that Stanley allowed the artists to uh, to graphically you know figure out the the story because you can it could just be more visually interesting. But Joe Dorowski was on that documentary as well talking about that collaboration, and he was just describing like you know Mobius is is an artist, uh, Stanley is a businessman uh, it, within an industry. And how the sort of butting heads uh, with that kind of, um, you know, prevented future works. Yeah. Mignola's on there talking about this Silver Surfer uh, piece as well. He was at Marvel at the time. Great documentary, In Search of Mobius. Like, check it out. I love this cover. I love these, like, cartoon animal characters. And you can see, you know, like, he. this is a pace that yeah. will replace the figure looking away. Uh, but this is the issue that Wood's credited with writing, too. Like, if we wanted to look at a Daredevil, uh, I would be down for, for Daredevil number 10 for that reason. Mm -hmm. I have it in black and white in the essential. Yeah, I think I think that would be a really fun one to check out. And, I mean, the, you know, the, it's it's a different Wood, right? It's yeah. like a simpler composition, but it's, they're beautiful. All of these Daredevil pieces just pop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's simpler uh, line work and stuff, but but the structure is all there, man. Yeah, it's, it's a perfect-looking cover. So here is the... Uh, the paragraph on page rate, and I'll just read these out, make of them what you will. Uh, $38 a page from EC in the 50s. Highest rate in the industry was $200 per page at Mad Magazine, where he was the most popular artist and then stormed out whenever they <laughs> recommended a, a revision or something. That self-destructive uh, stereotype about artists. Marvel starting rates were $20 per page to pencil and $15 to ink. Out of respect for wood, they paid him $45 per page to pencil and ink, so seven, you know, about 10 bucks more than your than your typical guy would get paid. Um, let's see. K, K Fabers, somebody uh, run, the, run the numbers through an inflation calculator and put it in the comments. He also, uh, 20 bucks a page to write, 
which is something he fought for at Marvel. If he was coming up with the story, he thought he should be paid for it and credited for it. So 20 pages to write it, or $20 a page to write it, and then two bucks a page off the pages he gave others to do. So if he's running his studio there and, and taking on work, you know, he would get a little bit of that from uh, kind of the work that he was overseeing, I guess. Okay, so like if the guy is getting 15 bucks to, to ink the thing, he, he gets duped two, two dollars of that. And you know, they, they talk about him like plotting and editing nearly everything that he had any kind of involvement on that was coming through his studio essentially. And of course he goes from Marvel then to tower with the thunder agents, which he was kind of overseeing virtually everything that was happening there and drawing as much as he could. Uh, and you know, everything leading up to this training for that kind of thing. Like, can he write and maintain all of these characters and continuity and everything himself? Yeah, it's an interesting property because it's gone through so many publishers, and I wonder how how that works in terms of ownership. I have so many questions about Thunder Agents and yeah. Power. Th these are comics. I don't think I've read one page of these things. I've seen some reprints here and there. Uh, going through this book makes me want to rectify that and get into them you a little could, bit. You could, interestingly, you could find them for very cheap sometimes. Yeah, like I've, I've never paid a dollar for it. Man, I got about four or five issues. Yeah, I am kind of curious to check it out. Uh, it seems like even in an interview, excerpts of an interview with him, he talks about working himself pretty thin, uh, you know, as he was overseeing several of these books. They started to do spin-off books, and it, it seemed like it might have been his limit. There's some uh, Wood Ditko st stuff yeah. in there that's pretty great. I've read a bunch of them. I love them. They're great, but it is a really good argument for, like, what Stan Lee brings to the table because yeah. you can kind of directly compare these to the daredevils and as great as these are they are missing like a little like key ingredient such a like there's like this stiffness from this era we see on the previous page there was a couple pieces and you see you see these like super stiff figures on on every single page well you know what like would how much superhero stuff did he do prior to this so like his figures were super stiff it's just he was doing knights in armor and guys in sci-fi gear so it's like now you got to do guys who like tumble and swing around and it just kind of you know, and and you've scaled back all your noodling too, so it's kind of you know putting your weakness itself. on display. Yeah, that stiffness is discussed. Uh, you know, it's one of the distinct char char characteristics of his art, and it's discussed in in some of this text. But it's also been written about by critics. You know, like Dan Nadell wrote about Woods the stiffness of his figures, and compared to uh, somebody like Ogden Whitney, another guy who has that stiff clip art style. Um, it makes him unique. You yeah, know, in in a, in a world with with a Ditko and with with uh, Kirby and their dynamism, it is a very different approach. I've, I've seen it described as a positive by some critics, and Dan might be one of them, of these just kind of like these uh, weightless figures that just kind of like hang in the air. It, it, it's, it's a different flavor of comics. I always think of it as almost clip art-like. Totally. And Ed, you talk about when you were a kid and you saw this stuff and it intimidated you. That stuff would intimidate me because it's like there's nothing extra there and it looks perfect. Yeah. And it was like, I don't know how you do that. Like, I can kind of hatch out the stuff I can't draw well. Yeah. But when it comes to, like, one line and this figure is perfect and dynamic and, you know, big and powerful looking, that was really tough for me to, to think, like, yeah, you'll figure out how to do that eventually. Yeah, per These perfect structure. Love those. But they do have that stiff kind of quality. It's it's almost uh, what I think of as DC style compared to a Marvel yeah. style. Yeah, but I, I like so far prefer this to like the DC stuff. But it is, yeah. He brings a lot to it too. Yeah. You know, saying the figures are a little bit static does not talk about the great Everything compositions. Else, yeah. and, you know, like this is such a cool composition to me. And there's not that much going on, but somehow I love it. So I wonder if this is also how like Wood viewed superheroes because again we didn't see a lot of superhero stuff prior to the Marvel stuff so maybe he's like this is how you do stu superheroes this is Siegel and Schuster this is like simplified guy run, you know minimal detail don't slow things down very much the idealized like good looking guy too clean uniform clean lines yeah it could be it could definitely be a conscious style choice love this and he's involved with with Tower and with Thunder Agents for I think almost four years so a big lot of work coming out of this looking at himself in the mirror yeah famous self-portrait funny how many times he draws himself in these comics in different comics these are harvey war comics here uh, again you know he's working with several publishers most of the time here are some examples of warren the uh the great black and white publisher you know kind of in a way a successor to ec comics in some ways you yeah, saw a lot sure. of the ec comics show up there uh, this was when I flagged that for the duo shade example, but uh, you know we've already seen several of those. But man, some of the stuff like the planes, 
it's incredible to me how well he draws that stuff. That's that stuff that, you know, he's tracing off probably. He probably. That shit perfectly. Looks great though. But, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't hate on that because he's adding all that modeling and shadow and it looks like a Wally Wood piece of illustration. I think when he would compose his stuff and prepare his pages, it would be like a collage almost. I remember, I think, uh, Larry Hama mm -hmm. described it. It's like this collage of found imagery and shit. And then, uh, you know, it goes through the Wally Wood filter, turns into a Wally Wood page. They discussed that in here too and how like the photocopier might have been uh, one tool too many for wood because of the stuff he said they would go through like the Sunday flyer you know like the newspaper stuff and cut out every single car you know and they would just have all these cars and it would just be like that's a panel drop the car in maybe draw a face in the window or the word balloon coming out of the car but it was like literally just take that half-toned car from the newspaper put it on the page <laughs> photocopy it and put it on the page these are some of those albums uh, more of those albums that I mentioned and I love these so much because they feel like you know, it's trendy or whatever at different times for people to appropriate comic style, comic book style artwork for something. This is being done by a master of it. So you get the cool lettering, you get kind of these almost cover like compositions. It just feels like this nails that so well. And of course it should, you know, like he's winning awards for comic book artists of the year from National Cartoonist Society. Like he's the apex in a lot of ways for that, you know, that skill set. And now he's applying it to the square cover compositions. I think they look really cool. I love the, t the lettering too, uh, tied uh, in. Imagine how arresting this would be if you're at the Goodwill and you're yes. looking through a bunch of, you know, Saturday Night Fever albums, and, and then you come to something like this, you will stop dead in your freaking tracks, man. Yeah. Very thoughtful. And now getting into uh, doing some of his own publishing with Wit's End. How many times was this pose cribbed <laughs> off of freaking Wally Wood, man? Anytime you got to draw Wolverine. <laughs> yes. Totally. I mean, he invented Wolverine's hair. Dave Cockrum shows up here early. This reminds me so much of Predator. Like, I feel like this might be a piece of concept art for Predator, of Predator from that tree point of view. This is a uh, Hal Foster swipe ah, from, from, uh, from Tarzan. And, and also, uh, Frazetta swiped this for a painted uh, Tarzan cover or something kind of neat they get into wits end and in his self-publishing a few times throughout this and how like it, it sold well they did multiple printings but didn't really generate money and i don't know if that's like not calculating cover cost or overprinting runs or something but it, it's it's a weird almost a mystery the way it's presented in here where it's like he at some point decides to do this you know to publish these and it seems to be successful, but there's no money at the end of the process. <laughs> Can't help but think of like the John Porcelino conversation where he's running his distro and <laughs> and uh, cartoonists are <laughs> spending two bucks to, to print up their comic and selling it for a buck fifty. Yeah. <laughs> there's one of his Alka-Seltzer famous, famous ads. Famous. Uh, you know, to point at what he could have been doing in terms of generating money from, uh, I, from his art. I feel like we're still seeing like the descendants of these creatures in commercials today, just like a CGI version of like, you know, toe fungus or something. Oh yeah. <laughs> this was a tops thing where they were doing these crazy little comics. They were like little eight page comics, I guess, you know, trading card size. I love these. Like, look how much of this stuff they reproduce in this book, you know, like issues worth of these things. <laughs> the flush. The only thing is I can't figure it out. They're they're They show seven of, pages from all of these you know including the cover so i don't know if back cover might have been an ad or something like that but it's like it doesn't quite add up yeah. same thing with like black and white cover maybe it's just because it's original art and then you have certain pieces in color and maybe that's because they don't have the originals available but still man that's super awesome that these things exist at all man peter max magazine the realist we talked about this, Ed, uh, in a past video on Wally Wood and some of his porn slash adult comics, uh, but one of his most famous images and, and probably one of the uh, several examples in this book of his bad business acumen. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Famous for taking a payout rather than a percentage uh -huh. of, of royalties for future sales, which uh, that thing sold very well. Bucky Ruckus just sounds generic. Yeah, unpublished strip for the most part, and some of it very nice. Some of it ended up in Witsend. Some of it ended up in the Whammo Giant comic, which Here's we joint. Yeah, this is haven't looked at yet, 
but uh, still considered like the biggest comic. 1967 Whammo, you know, inventor of all these little toys and, and knickknacks. They decide they're going to do a, the world's biggest comic and put those in toy stores. I don't know that it sold very well, but kind of an interesting project in that uh, I just, well, probably two and a half feet tall or something. It's very scary when Whammo gets involved because it's basically this company saying that you're a fad. <laughs> and and uh, as as another artist like in the game like I I would I feel like I would have gotten nervous like oh man is comics the the next hula hoop frisbee yeah I think nervousness was definitely a part of all these guys lives a lot of anxiety more of the wits end pretty nice cover here interesting format the way they would do that with like cover art art on the bottom third and then a the, nice clear title very fanzine man. And this is that uh, that 3D EC piece, but printed as the completed, uh, unseparated. Print. Well, it you know not in 3D, not in 3D so you're 3D, just right. seeing his, yeah. his artwork there. Would send something that we'll probably dig into at some point on this show, I imagine. Pretty famous for that, I don't know, self-publishing, multi-artist anthology piece. Is that an elephant's ass? <laughs> Probably tells you a lot about uh, his level of enthusiasm for the late 60s comic scene. They also chronicle his ups and downs health-wise because like, he goes through a lot of those, like some really severe time periods of migraines and an inability to work in some cases from uh, various health elements. Have you guys done any Captain Action episodes that might be worth doing? You got some issues? I do. I, I got a particular one I can recommend. Captain Action, pushing Superman out of the way to save the day. <laughs> I think this is a Joe Orlando deal, you know, like bringing Wood in whenever he has an editorial position at DC, offering his old buddy Wood some work. Heroes, Inc., uh, you know, weird comic in that it's, I don't know who publishes this thing, but I think it was for military distribution. And then, like, a couple decades ago, they found a warehouse, an army warehouse full of these things. Like, the distro just didn't happen at least not on a uh, on a wide level uh, but you can still find these things and you know it's more of that self-published trying to do your own thing and i guess this is the origins of canon who uh -huh. he would go on to use that character in military publications but this first story pencils ditko uh, inks wally wood i actually like this heroes inks a lot it's yeah, just these too. three short stories but you kind of see him almost in pitch mode with these concepts and some of them are relatively cartoony Gil Kane, somebody he frequently would collaborate with, uh, right. usually doing inks over Kane's pencils. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, they, they cite several of these examples, and I guess they're mostly DC publications. Yeah, he'd ink, like, I think Bob Brown uh, on, like, Superboy. Is this his pitch piece? It must be. Um, I don't see it marked clearly, but I, I assume that's what... Yeah, I think this is his pitch wow, piece. Wow, Pencils and inks. Pitch perfect. That's like spot on. I feel 1970. Like I've seen, yeah, I feel like I've seen a different one, too. So, so he must have done, you know, maybe the standard, like, three or yeah, whatever. Yeah, I would guess that he would do more, more than one. When, when you see this, it's like, what juice... Like, John Colin Murphy, like, is he, is he like a... Um, like a goody goody, you know, like a teacher's pet kind of guy or something. Because I mean, this is this is who you choose. Yeah, Colin Murphy and Gray Morrow also trying out for it. Murphy, of course, gets it, and they write a little bit about this and the idea that like Wood is sort of channeling Foster, and we've yeah. seen him do that with a lot of cartoonists. Whereas Murphy was sort of chasing, uh, he was always channeling someone, mm -hmm. and Foster being kind of like a peak draftsman is who he really kind of chased and channeled, and in a way. I guess that's what they thought made the most sense. Like, you, you know, I, there's there's just... These syndicates, they don't have room to play either. And John Cullen Murphy is a proven quantity with some previous strips that he did. Wally Wood, notoriously kind of slow. Like, this might have this might have killed the, Wally Wood if he had that kind of rigorous schedule. I, I was just thinking, if Wally Wood did that, <laughs> like, he might still be alive today. You know, because <laughs> it's a great payday, and you know, like, steady work and doing exactly what he wants to do. I wonder even if there's reputation involved. You know, like, at that point, if they're looking at these yeah. samples and being like, okay, all these guys are pretty good. One guy's proven his dependency, and one guy's kind of bouncing around and doing a lot of different things, and, and maybe we go with the uh, the safer the safer choice, maybe. This is cool. So, Wood doing the art on Astonishing Tales, number one, this this Doctor Doom story. I don't have this. That's one that's now on my radar, because mm -hmm. it looks damn good, and yeah, it looks damn good yeah. in color. I mean, great in black and white original, but, you know, sometimes... 
I don't know, man. Sometimes the color stuff just looks really sharp to me, and I feel like that's a beautiful piece. Yeah, and that's that, from it. yeah. Could you do a better panel mm -hmm. of, of Doctor Doom? And there's your eyeballs, Ed. Yeah. But it looks pretty like a template was used for those eyeballs, man. A compass or something. Characters for Marvel starting to get it, bringing out Tower of Shadows, having these like sword and sorcery kind of anthology and characters, and so that's what you see there, like some sketches for potential hosts for those stories. Uh, ended up going with the artist as their own host, so once again we get a Wally Wood portrait in one of these issues, and all those Tower of Shadows seems like a pretty good book too. As Marvel, they must have collected those as like an omnibus or they, something, right? Well, I mean, like way you know, decades ago they collected them as in these like little hardcover. Things. There's not there's not a ton of these uh, Wally Wood stories, but they have like the Wally Wood, you know, fantasy, Marvel, this and that. Not sure who he's inking over somebody in these, but I'm not not sure who. Looks like Marie Severin, maybe. Ross Andrew, I think. Poster print, Adam and Eve. Famous image, man. And there's the cat. Yes. Piece. <laughs> some white out applied to that. Yeah, so yeah. To make that the one bullpen not. had some work. <laughs> Releasable. This, this is one of my favorite comics. Oh, yeah, man. I read that in the uh, comics by Les Daniels book when I was yeah. a kid. What a composition that is for a page. It's a real stunner. And, you know, more war and work there from Vampirilla. Uh, the cannon strip. So this is one of those military strips that starts out in the early 70s and ran for, I think, a couple of years. This was one of my favorite early wood comics that I read. A, a lot of wood is not that easy to come by, especially when I was a young collector and I got hold of like the collection of Canon and it was oversized. Mm -hmm. And it feels like the uh, like the the men's paperbacks. I don't know what yeah. that genre is exactly, but it's that tough guy, macho mm -hmm. kind of stuff. That's what it reads like to me and found it to be real, uh, real enjoyable. The Wallywood School of Comic Art and Applied Psychology. This was like a gimmick gag piece that he created and gave to everybody for Christmas, you know, all of his, uh, all of his gift to Dan assistants. Atkins. Yes. Larry Ham, I think Hama, got yeah. one. <laughs> and, uh, Hama talks about it as being, would just talk the whole time he worked. And it was about everything, politics and, you know, philosophy and whatever he had on his mind. And so, uh, that, that's your applied psychology is sitting in that room, working with him and listening <laughs> and the uh, famous 20, 22 panels that always work. Although I think there's 24 actually here. Hammer put one of these together at Marvel. That's the uh, the one that I would print out, but it was yeah. like copy paper, like three of them horizontally arranged. So I don't know that there's an original anywhere, but that was the one I always think of. Sally Forth, like the companion piece to the Canon strip, Fanographics has put together collections of both of those. And uh, I was real excited because this was out of print for a while. And when I finally found one, I was so excited because I liked Canon. Didn't like this one as much. But looking at it, I kind of love the cartooning. Like the, it's very, it's much more cartoonish. The yeah. canon stuff being a little more straightforward action adventure. Yeah, style. canon's just like a full reading experience. These are little jokey stop yes. start kind of things. And there are different Sally Forth comics out there. There, there were Sally Forth strips uh, that were different than this. That I think, I think it's all been collected in different, uh, different packages over the years. Yeah, I have some like European right. magazines that have some of this, like you know, in French. Yeah, it feels like this makes total sense in a market that's selling Barbarella and, and books of that sort. I always wonder how all these originals survive. You think of Wood's lifestyle, and it's it's a little bit surprising. Love this, this is kind of cool. Too, yeah. So this is a like a late era apex for him, and the story behind this, I forget who, but one of the one of his assistants came to his house at one point and saw this like laying on the table. He did all of this himself with no assistance because he was tired of criticism that his assistants were doing everything mm -hmm. and, you know, recognized and celebrated as one of his top stories. And it's like, man, it's killer. And it's awesome. This book shows all the originals from this story. But like, goodness, like, mm -hmm. wow. Talk about putting it all on the page. Some yeah. dense pages. Got a bitch left the critics every now and then, man. Yeah, let them know you still got it. Like, who on earth would be doing work comparable to this in the 70s look at just the level of detail mm -hmm. with uh just the work with the exacto blade to cut the zips in, in those like little areas the exact thing that you would have an assistant do yeah look at that water you know painted from those zip tones and of course always room for some double lighting one of his staples 
yeah, just stunning. Very awesome to have that that story reprinted uh, from originals. Big Apple comics we looked at briefly on one of uh, I think one of the Ides draws, but kind of a East Coast attempt at underground comics. A very interesting object and some some iconic imagery coming out of that from Wally Wood. I think this is his last Mad Magazine assignment. He could come back after a couple years and, and turn that in. Did some Atlas stuff primarily over top of Ditko pencils. Mm -hmm. Kind of cool and uh, cheap books you can find. Same with DC. Stalker drawn by Ditko with wood inks and it's that barbar sword and sorcery barbarian stuff. Pretty fun. You could always find those under the stairs at Ides. Yeah, pretty easy to come by. Doing humor. You can't bind Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, he inked uh, Kirby, like one of the last comics Kirby did at DC. Um, Sandman. Yeah, and, and like the, it was like the final issue of the Sandman Wood came in and, and inked that one. I didn't know that. That'd be one to track down, too. It's yeah. probably not... Uh... Not a super expensive book, 1976, but that would be a fun one to see. Those two. Man, both of them near, nearing the end of their careers, teaming up. And now starting to uh, get into some of the adult work. And, Ed, we looked at, like, the, uh, I guess, the pen and ink drawings of these, and we're speculating that they were, like, covers and bottom half of a cover and stuff, so there you get to see them as they actually appeared on the covers of Screw Magazine. Funny to go from, you know, sketch to, to finish. It's pretty close. And I guess the Wizard King, his last yeah. big hurrah. Love it. Not sure what the deal is there. Surviving a, uh, a house fire. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I think I think there was like a very famous f fire at his studios, man. I don't know if it was at his studios. There was a place where somebody had a bunch of work, and a bunch of it was in like a metal filing cabinet. And the, and the cabinet like fused shut in the fire, so that work survived. I think it was EC Pages. Uh, but that may have been from that same fire, probably, and maybe stuff that wasn't protected as well or wasn't in a cabinet like that. It's funny because for the subject matter, it kind of works. Yeah, it's yeah. it's like rescued tablets uh -huh. of yore. I, I considered that looking at this the first <laughs> time through. Like, is that an effect? Is he doing something there? Barry Blair influence, uh, <laughs> I think, from some of that stuff. There it is, dude. Ink and Frank Miller, baby. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's super that, cool. That whole cover feels you know, mm -hmm. like a very appropriate homage. I think that was like the first Daredevil comic I bought, and it was just the strength wow. of that cover. Wonder Woman inks, I believe, uh, John, John Delbo pencils. Just generic, man. And then some of the uh, kind of the portfolio art you know, theme collection kind of stuff that would be published near the end. Weird Sex Fantasy, Gang Bang 1 to 3. Playing the hits. Going back to the... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of courageous, man, in a post-Air Pirates Funnies kind of world, right? Where, you know, the Air Pirates, I think they had to pay two, three million dollars. While he would have probably like, tell him to come get me. Yeah. <laughs> With his rack of guns and axes <laughs> and stuff. That vein, man, like, Klaus is merciless when he draws his <laughs> Wally Woods. Yeah. The, the uh, vein and, like, the Cocoa Puffs all over his face, like, Klaus just draws every single one. He ain't fooling nobody looking all clean cut like that. And that's basically it for this book. I love these things, man. It makes me really mad. There's two other ones. I think Russ Heath has one and John Buscema oh, man. that uh, I did not buy while they were still available. And now they're they're certainly marked up quite a bit. There's such good reproductions of like, you know, just a wide range of original art covering their career. Beautiful books. Like this stuff just didn't exist in the 90s. I, I feel like in terms of production and maybe even being able to put your hands on that many originals, you know. You see the list of like who's who's making those available, and it's a huge network of people that have little bits and pieces that go into a book like this. So uh, I'm very grateful for these organizers that put this together because I'm sure it's no easy task to assemble that much of the originals. Absolutely, man. Such a pleasure to go through uh, the life and career of uh, the great Wallace Wood, one of the great ink slingers in comic book history.
You guys good? Yeah. All right, K Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, what's out there? Join me on patreon.com slash jimrug where you can download my out of print, hard to find zines and mini comics. You can see a lot of my original art, lots of my process. Uh, patreon.com slash jimrug. Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics, Fantastic Four Grand Design, and my YouTube channel, Total Recall Show. Red Room Comics in the Wild, uh, every four weeks, murder on, murder on the Dark Web for fun and profit. Uh, order, pre-order the comics through the Fantagraphics website or your local comic shop. If you want to read the comics ahead of time, hit up my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks for the entire archive, and there are over 100 pages at this point. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Jimmy, give him one last set of marching orders, man. We're going to be on our way. Read more comics.